That's about right. Okay. So, what are we going to talk about this morning? We're going to talk about the error of our ways. Um, the uh, when you produce software, there's something else that you also produce with a very high probability. Bugs. Defects. A bug is a deficit in functionality. What you said is, well, we're going to give you this, but actually you got a little bit less. Normally, sometimes you get a little bit more. Okay? Sometimes it's a security issue. You increase the attack surface area of an application. Sometimes the consequences go beyond that. And one of the potential problems that we have in software development is focus. Now, normally we think of focus as a good thing. Focus is a kind of human ability where what you do is you divert all of your attention, all of your energy onto something. And you are able to manage the detail and understand the detail. That sounds brilliant. That's exactly what you need for your job. Except, by definition, if you are focusing on something, you are not focusing on something else. And it turns out that as we focus in on the code, the software, our tools, we are missing something. Sometimes we can miss an awful lot. We like to use the term full-stack developer a lot. I, no, I say we. I don't like using it. Because whenever anybody says, hey, I'm a full-stack developer, I say, oh, so um, tell me about the work you've done in device drivers. Oh, oh, I, I don't do that. Well, the full stack goes all the way down. Okay, that is what full means. Yeah. So all of you people who've got full stack development on your on your CV, I suggest you put partial stack developer. Okay. So it's partial application. However, this isn't to talk about functional programming. Um, uh, brief introduction. This is ultimately, in one sense, to talk about our experience and software architecture. Um, experience when distilled and named, we can call a pattern. Not all patterns are good. Some patterns are bad patterns. Some patterns are habits and repetitions, oversights that we deal with. Now, last year when I gave the end note, I was focusing on detailed code patterns. Here, I want to go outside and look at some of these other things. But I also care a great deal about the detail. Um, hence why I was involved in 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. Now, one of the things I like doing is taking photographs. I enjoy taking photographs. I enjoy taking photographs of books. Books are much easier than people. They stay still. But occasionally, you get some really interesting photographs. These are photographs of the moment. Okay, This is 2006, October, Madrid, Terminal 1. Okay? Um, this is actually a, uh, a DOS-based system. So, just to clarify, 2005, this is a DOS-based system. This is um, a failure from a, uh, a TCP IP stack. Um, it took me years to find that one out, the detail of it. Um, but most people don't see that. People home in on particular words. People enjoy the word free. Yeah? You've got everybody else going through. It's going like, free, free. Where do I claim my five free packets? Hi. That's a huge error message. I had to take two photographs of it. Okay? So I like collecting error messages. But it has got to the point where one of the most interesting things is we see, so sometimes it's in your browser. It's not in the public space. It's in your browser. But your browser is just as public. If millions of people use an application, that's a public space. And here's one from a couple of years ago. Your feedback will be used to improve Facebook. Uh, I'm going to say evidence suggests that that's not true. Um, but nonetheless, I submitted this. Thanks for taking the time to make a report. How much time? 31st of December, 1969. Wow. That's some serious time you've got there. That's some serious time travel. I'm going to take a wild guess that mm, very few people in this room were born. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg certainly wasn't. Facebook did not exist. There wasn't even an internet or an ARPANET. <laughs> So what we learn is just as in the previous one, I learned about the failure and the operating software and platform of that display sign. 
Here, we have learnt that they've got a sort of a simple negative, and they've got a simple sign bug, that this is using Unix time, which began, the beginning of time was the 1st of January 1970. Okay? Anything that happened before that is another universe. Okay? Um, so, the 1st of January 1970, but what we've ended up with is sort of minus one. And that's gone back in time to the 31st of December, 1969. So what we're seeing is that when a system fails, it's like dropping something. When it breaks, you see the fracture lines. You see what it's made of. You see how it was constructed. Okay, this is an important thing. At that moment, all of your beautiful encapsulated abstractions disappear. The whole thing just falls apart, and you see it. It's now got to the point that people now send me error messages. I don't have to take photographs anymore or screenshots. People just send them to me. So um, let me have a look. So uh, here we are. Um, uh, the code is not uh, in Canada. Everything is in. Uh, we, we find everything's in uh, French and English, but the code is not. It's in PHP. Um, you can sort of see the structure there. Um, and obviously, somebody's got very imaginative with the address structure, get address line one. So I'm going to take a wild guess that there's get address line two. Yeah, I love copy and paste code in the morning. You know? so, uh, so, but it has got to the point that people now send this stuff to me uh, on Twitter. I retweet it. Um, and it's, get a, it's got a little extreme. Somebody's asked, they said, well, yeah, this is terrible. Your name, Kevlin, is now associated with failure. And this ultimately comes from this tweet last year. Apparently, I am now a, I am now, um, a thing. Um, literally, I saw a Kevlin Henney screen. Okay? So these are now Kevlin. They're not failure screens anymore. Apparently, they're that. Um, and it got to the point last year at uh, a conference um, where I live uh, in Bristol, Agile in the City, where the organizer, John Clapham, said to me, quick, come downstairs. There's a Kevlin Henney screen. And I want to take a photograph of you in front of the Kevlin Henney screen. Then I will tweet it, and then you retweet it. <laughs> I thought, brilliant. This year, I did the keynote at Agile in the City. And so we did this. <laughs> so we're getting kind of an inception moment. You know, so uh, uh, there is this. That. This is all good fun. And the, some of these are kind of amusing. When something fails in your application, then that's, that's annoying. Yeah? That's annoying. That's inconvenient. If it fails in your browser, that's annoying. It's inconvenient. Now, it turns out that American Airlines knew that I was going to do this talk, and that I needed new material for my talk. So on Wednesday, they had this little software hiccup. American Airlines computer glitch leaves it without pilots over Christmas. Um, American Airlines revealed it accidentally told too many of its pilots they could take time off the week of Christmas. Okay. Now, you can imagine that there's a lot of flights over Christmas. Okay. You need to have, turns out you actually need to have pilots on those planes. On the other hand, everybody wants to take holiday. So if you can, you will do. Um, faces a manpower crisis that could leave an estimated 15,000 flights with nobody to sit in the cockpit. We have moved beyond, oh, that's inconvenient for failing in my app. You know, that's an inconvenient browser uh, problem. I'm afraid I can't put through my money um, to buy or to purchase something. This is a wide-scale thing. Uh, looks like the scheduling system it uses to assign pilots to flights indicated there were plenty of captains and first officers to go around. Meanwhile, a separate system, oh, the joy of integration. And this is the important thing. Remember I said focus. What we end up doing is we focus on, is this correct? Based on my assumptions, and I ha even if I have tested, but nonetheless, there's my assumptions about how this works. Here is another thing that has assumptions and works. When I combine them, it doesn't, it, the assumptions don't reduce. They multiply. They breed. They are like rabbits. And this system got carried away uh, with a festive spirit and gave away too, uh, gave away too many uh, um, uh, uh, sort of holiday slots. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, one of my favorite examples that reveals multiple sides of this and demonstrates how much money you can lose, uh, we still got to work out how much money American Airlines are going to lose over this one, is Knight Capital, um, who in 2012 
uh, on the 1st of August 2012, going from the 31st of July to the 1st of August, they put new systems in place to take advantage uh, of effectively a new service or protocol offered by the New York Stock Exchange. Um, Knight Capital Group realized a $460 million loss in 45 minutes. Outstanding, $10 million a minute. I wish somebody would let me do that. Okay. Actually, it turns out that during the day, they lost a lot more than that. This is the final figure after everything was rolled back. In other words, there's a sort of agreement that if things are done in error, you can roll back the transactions. This is the result after the rollback. Problem is that around this time, uh, Knight Capital were only worth about 400 million, so they went bust. So what happened? Um, Doug Seven does this really nice uh, uh, work through of this from a sort of DevOps perspective. Actually, I think he does it more from an ops perspective, but I'll, I'll clarify that in a moment. Um, the update to SMARS, the system in, in uh, question, was intended to replace old, unused code, referred to as PowerPeg, functionality that hadn't, uh, Knight hadn't used in eight years. This is that's kind of interesting. And what he says is also revealing. The code that was updated repurposed an old flag that was used to activate the PowerPeg functionality. So what we've got is code that is not used. We've got something, a flag, that is no longer used that this code relies on. And now we're going to recycle that flag. It turns out this is something that you sometimes do in systems. I've certainly done it. Where you have something like a protocol or a space in a database, something like that, you recycle rather than change the schema. OK? This is not uncommon. I'm not saying it's good, but it's not uncommon. People do this because schema evolution, whether you're talking about protocols, databases, or whatever, is a pain. So if you can recycle something that was not used, then you tend to do so, except if a piece of code depends on that. Now, here's the point. He says, why code that had been dead for eight years was still present in the code base is a mystery. But that's not the point. No, it is the point. And it's not a mystery. What we do is, because we can't see it, we leave it there. We think it doesn't cause any harm. It's dead, OK? All I'm going to say is that people who think that leaving dead code lying around is OK have not watched enough zombie movies, <laughs> OK? Fear the zombie. This code came back to life. This code, this code had really bad behavior. And the point here is this is, this is the point, because it doesn't matter if if the other thing we're going to look at had happened, it's the perfect storm. It's a perfect storm. The presence of this plus one other problem is what made the problem. This had been fine for eight years, so we had that problem. Had they had an incorrect installation, that would have been fine. It would have been great, but it would have been fine. It's the two. A perfect storm is not this or that. It is this and that. So this is perceived as a dev issue, but let's actually look at the Securities and Exchange Commission's report on the event. During the deployment of the new code, however, one of Knight's technicians did not copy the new code to one of the eight SMARS computer servers. Manual copying. This is how we roll, OK? We are going to manually copy from one server to another. And OK, there are things that in life that are done manually. OK, I, uh, one of the things we've just talked about aircraft and airports. If you fly, you will hear at some point that there is a check that is done by the flight attendants. They will say, um, doors to manual or doors to automatic and cross-check, or arm doors and cross-check, or disarm doors and cross-check. What does that cross-check mean? It means that you, it, it kind of helps to make sure the doors are on an aircraft, okay, like properly closed. Yeah, there's not a lot of air up there. So what do they do? This is a manual task. You get a friend. You cross-check. Somebody else checks your work. Knight did not have a second technician review this deployment. So not only were they doing it manually, they had no review. And no one at Knight realized that the PowerPay code had not been removed from the eighth server. So now you have seven servers correctly implementing the new functionality. The eighth server is activated with a different interpretation of that flag and starts trading like crazy. They're not sure what's going wrong, so guess what? They roll back all the other servers. Hello, 460 million, or goodbye, 460 million. This is 
an ops question. DevOps is both. I find a lot of people who are focusing on DevOps are focusing on Dev or Ops. It's the combination of the both. It's the perfect storm that we've created here. Um, so about a year ago, and this is an artist's impression of the Schiaparelli lander, part of the Exo, uh, European Space Agency's ExoMars mission. And uh, it was supposed to land on the surface of Mars um, last October. Actually, it did land on the surface of Mars, but not quite the way that was intended. Um, a report from the time, Schiaparelli's inertial measurement unit went about the business of calculating the lander's rotation rate for some reason, which we now know to be a kind of a, we could describe it as a sticky flag or sticky state. Uh, the IMU calculated a saturation maximum period that persisted for one second longer than what would normally be expected at this stage. And that led to a rather interesting result. When the IMU set this bogus information to the craft's navigation system, it calculated a negative altitude. It calculated that it was below ground. In fact, we can go to the um, uh, European Space Agency's report, which makes for some interesting reading. One of the things I love about um, spaceflight disasters is, there, is, the, is this kind of euphemistic language. It's an anomaly. It's not, you lost a probe, it smashed into Mars. It decorated the surface of Mars with metal. It's an anomaly. Because of the error of the estimated attitude, so it's actually to do with attitude, on entry, a craft will wobble slightly, they had underestimated how, much, underestimated how much it will wobble, and the sticky state had a bit of a problem. Um, the GNC software projected the RDA range measurements with an erroneous off-vertical angle. Okay, what does that mean? It basically thought the probe was upside down. And it took the cosine of the angle. It turns out that the cosine of an angle greater than 90 degrees is negative. And there was no code to handle that, because, of course, it can never happen. Yeah? Aha. <laughs> and at this point, at this point, what happens is the poor probe is heading into the atmosphere, and it says, oh my god, I'm already there. Quick. Get rid of the parachute, throw off the back shell, get the legs out, come on, we get, get. <sighs> Disappointingly, it was nearly 4,000 meters above the ground at this point. It turns out that although Mars's gravity is weaker, 4,000 meters is still 4,000 meters. And you can actually see the crater from orbit. The ExoMars probe passed over it, and you can see the crater. Um, a few years ago, the Mars Polar Lander actually was destroyed because it miscalculated something, and that was just 40 meters above ground, and it fell. Um, it, turns out that it turns out you want to be landing at zero, at zero meters per second. That's really helpful. So let's look away from this. We can see that these things cost. These are very public errors. Sometimes they cost money. Sometimes they are mission critical. Well, there's an interesting paper from uh, 2014, uh, Yuan uh, et al. Um, simple testing can prevent most critical failures. So here's, so here's the point. This is a, a paper with a very obvious title. It says exactly what it means. An analysis of production failures in distributed data intensive systems. Yeah, I, I had, um, uh, so this is interesting because what they did is they went through um, a whole load of uh, distributed systems and looked at their failure modes. And one of the things they discovered was that almost all catastrophic failures are the result of incorrect handling of non-fatal errors explicitly signaled in software. In other words, these are not the happy day paths. These are the edge cases. These are the, well, that doesn't happen very often, or that can't happen. Yeah? So it's not normally the happy day scenarios. It's normally the failure handling. And sometimes those failure situations can be difficult either to anticipate, or more importantly, people find them difficult to test. And so they don't, or they just assume, oh, it looks good enough. And unfortunately, our, our human brain is not very good at appreciating what risk is. We're not very good at probability, first of all. And so what we do is we look at that and say, well, that's not very likely. It's not very probable that this would occur. So I don't need to spend a lot of effort on it. By the way, this is not your conscious brain thinking. This all happens before you actually realize you're thinking. So we don't think it's very probable. But risk is not simply probability, it's exposure to the probability. Loss of mission is pretty major. Yeah? It's not just, ooh, we lost a few, uh, few euros here and there. It's actually, we lost the whole thing. And risk is a 
compounded problem. What can we do? Well, a bit more unit testing, and also after the fact, put tests in place. It turns out many people um, uh, kind of quote, I, I now use this figure a lot, a majority of the production failures, 77%, so three quarters, can be reproduced by a unit test. I find this fascinating, and I had an interesting one recently where somebody had taken a photograph of this slide, tweeted it, and somebody said, yeah, well, that's okay for like academic systems, but if you're doing real distributed development, um, then this doesn't work. So I pointed out that it comes from a paper that was about distributed systems. Um, yeah, 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 but in our case, it's different. No, really, it isn't. Statistically speaking, unless you're doing a really, really good job, um, most of the things that you think you can't test are testable. Um, now, it turns out there wasn't just American Airlines that managed to have a little IT cock up this week. Um, uh, this is a Soyuz 2 launching uh, from um, uh, 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 Vostochny Cosmodrome, which um, uh, Roscosmos has just completed. Um, and it's just about kind of northeastish of China. Um, and so they were due to launch on Tuesday. They successfully launched, um, or partly successfully launched, um, a uh, number of satellites. Uh, but not completely. Soyuz fails to deliver 19 satellites from Vostochny. Um, there was one main satellite, Meteor M21, which was supposed to monitor weather and climate, and then 18 other satellites on the payload. It turns out that the first stage went up fine. All the stages went up fine. The last stage that delivers it to orbit also worked perfectly to the wrong information. It turns out, although the information is still preliminary, it is increasingly clear all the hardware aboard the Fregat upper stage performed as planned. But almost unbelievably, the flight control system on the Fregat did not have the correct settings. It turns out that this was originally due to launch um, uh, from Baikonur, and they'd forgotten to change the config. <laughs> Baikonur is in Kazakhstan, so they moved it all the way over to far eastern Russia, and the third stage kicks in, and it says, right, where am I? Whoa, I am way off course. Quick, correct course. It was seen re-entering the atmosphere near Iceland. So, thank you very much, American Airlines and Roscosmos, for giving me some new information this week, and allowing me to refer to another paper that I like to refer to. Early detection of configuration errors to reduce failure damage. People have this thing in their head that they think, well, there's my code, and then there's other stuff. There's my code, and there's configuration. There's my code, and these other things, scripts and other files. These are not my code. Look at them carefully. Try to describe them to members of your family. It's code. You will discover that these are encoded data. They have a particular format. They have correctness. People have a really bad habit of not validating, unit, uh, testing their configuration, but also they have the problem of what we call latent configuration errors. Bugs in the configuration that stay in the system until the last possible moment rather than being detected early. Treat these as your code. It's a blind spot that we have. So, having dealt with some of the fun this week and last year, let's go back a bit. Because there's a very interesting way of classifying and reasoning about our software systems and therefore their failures. This comes from uh, 1980. Uh, Maya Manny Lehman, Programs, Life Cycles and Laws of Software Evolution. This is a brilliant paper. Um, and I say, I, I read it many years ago and then I read it again um, last year uh, or the year before, thinking this is really interesting because so much of what he says is still the case. It's such a valid classification. And he has this classification of three kinds of programs, S programs, P programs, and E programs. To understand S programs, he says, okay, these are the simple ones, but S is not for simple, it's for specification. Programs whose function is formally defined by and derivable from a specification. These are the things that are easy to unit test. Okay, there is this idea that I can create something and unit test it. The classic lab rat of computer science, um, the sorting algorithm is an example of, uh, uh, of such a um, S code. But there are a lot of systems where we can actually say the formal transformation of this data into this data, this is understandable and testable. Okay, very, very simple. Um, a lot of, so accountancy, anything that has a clear set of rules, um, 
from which you can derive a specification and therefore the program. P programs, however, are a little bit different. P means we have a procedure for recognizing the correct result, but that doesn't mean we know how to do it. So for example, a chess program, I know what the rules of chess are, but even knowing the rules of chess does not mean that I can work out how to write a good chess AI or chess program. We've ended up having to go via AI to get good chess programs. That's nothing to do with the rules of chess, it turns out. It turns out that we have a procedure for recognizing, but not necessarily an automatic procedure for creating. It also re re deals with um, situations where we cannot get perfect results. So let's talk about something like climate uh, modeling. In climate modeling, you can never get a perfect result because you can never get perfect data, but also all of the calculations are done using floating point numbers. They are floating point, therefore they are approximations. The real world does not have such approximations. So we can recognize the acceptability of the solution, but we can say it's within a particular tolerance, but we can never get the exact recreation of the real world. It is not possible. So we have a procedure for recognizing acceptability. These are more complex, but they are still testable. They are still comprehensible. But many of the systems we now deal with are e-programs. And we don't realize that they're e-programs. Programs that mechanize a human or societal activity, the program has become a part of the world it models. It is embedded in it. And one of the examples that uh, Lehman gives in his paper is an air traffic control system. So sticking with the theme of air, air travel, an air traffic control system. If you imagine how an air traffic control system works, you have an air traffic controller who uses the data from the system to talk to an aircraft that will influence where the, aircraft, where the pilots take the aircraft next, which will then be detected by the aircraft, uh, the air traffic control system itself. So in other words, the air traffic control system is part of the whole system. These are surprisingly difficult to test. When you are doing social media, when you are doing uh, modeling of um, uh, uh, an economic uh, uh, outcome, uh, modeling finances, or anything like that, it turns out that you are effectively changing the world in which the software is in. It will change the future of that world. And we have a lot of these, and we are not very good at focusing on them. Now, uh, Christmas is coming, um, and I strongly recommend uh, this book, 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School. It's actually about proper architecture, uh, building architecture, not the soft stuff. Um, and about half of the advice is applicable to any creative or design-based domain. You go through it going like, yep, we do that in software, or yep, we should do that in software. Um, it's also very physically, it's a nice book to have. It's aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> and importantly, if people know you have it, they, this has another quality. They think you're far more intelligent, attractive, and cultured. Okay. Oh, so not just a software developer. Okay, they're sophisticated. They've got culture and, you know, a broader base of knowledge. Um, and there's a lot of good observations in there. They're quoting the uh, uh, Finnish um, uh, architect, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. The problem is, so first of all, a couple of points that Lehman says. He says that we really should be thinking about creating our large systems in terms of lots of S systems, things that are easily testable. And we can see that's been borne out by some of the earlier observations. But we're also saying that even when you think you have an S system, because I can test it like this, it lives in a larger world. What is that larger world? What, what, what side effects could this have that are beyond simply red and green? So let's uh, travel back to March last year. Um, there was a little bit of an outage, NPM. Um, uh, a developer pulled a whole load of their modules from NPM based, uh, over an intellectual property um, disagreement. And that developer was in, absolutely entitled to do this because it was their, it was their code. And what, what people discovered is accidentally they had a transitive dependency to a little piece of code, not very much code at all. Now, the first point here is that strictly speaking with NPM, you shouldn't really be using it for your deployment environment. It is about your development environment. That was a guideline in NPM. Um, and that we also need to keep this in mind. If you've not seen the kind of the joke O'Reilly books, 
They are wonderful. Well, they're not books, they're just book covers. But, you know, taking on needless dependencies, fragile development guide. Code written by some stranger on the internet is always perfect. Yeah? If you go around, you know, if you do, if you go around and you look at stuff, it's like, yeah, 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 I just found this on the internet. You know, oh, I copied this from Stack Overflow and all the rest of it. Okay, if you've got children, if you've got children, one of the things you will tell your children at some point when they are small is don't pick that up off the street, you don't know where it's been. Okay, I'm just going to leave it there, all right? So I want you to think about this one. This is a game of trust. And people were very surprised that they were not in control of their dependencies at runtime. Development time, you should be. Actually, you should be at runtime as well. So here is the code in question. It is not the best code in the world. Well, that's fine. I mean, when people offer things as open source, uh, it's, a, it's a generous gift. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily good. This is a rather strange and clumsy way of padding a string, left pad. Anyway, this was pulled. So I just want you to re remind you that this is not the hardest problem in software. We have lots of websites that now depend. They say, right, how do we pad a string? I have no idea how to do this complex software task. You know what? We'll use somebody else's code. Hmm. Anyway, this was pulled, so somebody else replaced it with this. Again, I have to say, I think it's generous that people do this, but this is, well, Anderson's Law, Paul Anderson, the science fiction author, I have yet to see any problem, however complicated, which, when you looked at it in the right way, did not become still more complicated. That is a skill we have in software development. Okay, I see what you want, I see what you want but I can make it much more interesting. I can, I can do things you would not believe. I, I'm going to use frameworks you've not even heard of because they've not been invented yet because I'm going to write them. Yeah. So we have a way of taking that complexity. It's like a game of poker. I see your complexity and I raise it. So I had a go at this, and granted, this is a slightly later version of, uh, of JavaScript. I thought, I'm not a JavaScript programmer, so I thought, oh, OK, uh, let's have a go at this. So it's, it's kind of four lines. Um, and there's an interesting thing that this code has. It has a very interesting property that the other two don't have. It works. This is a, this I was this was I was absolutely fascinated. I wrote this just to explore the complexity of it, but what I did is I wrote some tests because that's what you're supposed to do. So I wrote some tests. I wrote some simple tests, and um, I ran them. And when you run it against my, uh, so there's the names of the tests. I've got, so even in this short space, you can have fairly coherent stuff, single assertion for each one, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, you can actually create a very simple testing framework. Um, so nothing, nothing fancy. And when you run this against my code, it's all green. What I found fascinating is that when you run it against the code of the original left pad and the replacement left pad, it actually fails in a number of cases. So this code doesn't even correctly work in the way that you would expect, which I also found fascinating. So again, what we've got here is that somebody wrote an S program, in other words, left pad. They wrote a little piece of code that is testable, but not tested, that is testable and fully defined, but it was not that code that caused, it was not this that caused the problem. It was the world around it. It was the world of accidental dependencies that people were not managing, because they might have focused on the code, but they forgot that actually software is a system. So Dijkstra, a couple of years before he died, made this observation. I would therefore like to posit that computing's central challenge, how not to make a mess of it, has not been met. Most of our systems are much more complicated than can be considered healthy and are too messy and chaotic to be used in comfort and confidence. Now, this is around 2000. Let's go back in time. Let's go back even further. Okay, I, we've gone back to 1980. Dijkstra is a figure who has influenced computer science from the 1960s onward, but I want to take you on a time... Uh, we've also gone back to 1969. I want to take you back to the 19th century. Charles Babbage. The designer of the uh, difference engine and the analytical engine, uh, seen by many as kind of being as kind of grandfather of modern computing. Um, so, what I love here is, uh, is uh, something from one of his uh, uh, um, uh, journals. On two occasions, I have been asked, "Pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out?" I am not able rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. I mean, it's a, what do you mean? If I put 
garbage in, do I get the right thing out? No, garbage in, garbage out. It's really very, very simple. That's how we summarize it these days. And we have a very popular way of producing garbage. It's called the spreadsheet. Oh, oh, well, it's called code, but I'm going to focus now for spreadsheets because they are, again, another blind spot that we have. Often software developers do not consider spreadsheets as software. Oh, they are. They're a functional programming system that many, many people use. They're also slightly difficult to test and check to see if they're correct. And people's overconfidence um, blinds them to the errors that are embedded within them. Stephen Levy made this observation. People tend to forget that even the most elegantly crafted spreadsheet is a house of cards, ready to collapse at the first erroneous assumption. When did he make this observation? Well, <laughs> a spreadsheet way of knowledge was first published in 1984. He makes the observation, even then, in August 84, the Wall Street Journal reported the Texas-based oil and gas company had fired several executives after the firm lost millions of dollars in an acquisition deal because of errors traced to a faulty financial analysis spreadsheet model. So this is not new. This has been happening since the spreadsheet was young. It's also created very large problems. Again, people are focused on a simple model. But actually, we've seen that the errors, because these things have been unchecked, has led to some huge, huge societal consequences. This is one of the more infamous ones recently. Harvard University economists Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff have acknowledged making a spreadsheet calculation mistake in a 2010 research paper, Growth in a Time of Debt. This paper is important because this paper is the paper that created the concept of austerity, or was used to justify austerity economics, that swept through Europe and other parts of the world as a response to um, the economic crisis. And it was based on a spreadsheet bug. They accidentally forgot to include five rows. This is huge. This is absolutely massive. We are talking about two people who made an oversight in a non-peer-reviewed paper that was then picked up by governments that ultimately influenced the economies of many countries uh, and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. The correction is substantial. The paper said that countries with 90% de debt ratios see their economies shrink by 0.1%, which is not a lot, but it's still shrinkage. Instead, it should have found they grow by over 2%. That is huge. And speaking as somebody who's coming from Britain, where we have managed to create an economy that goes in exactly the opposite direction to the rest of Europe's economies, well done. So we've got a, we've got, we would kill for an economy that had that kind of growth. We've got an inflation that's above that, but we don't have an economy that's above that. So um, we've got some really interesting situations here that come out of this stuff. Um, again, speaking of economists and non-peer-reviewed papers, um, we see that this influences science and science denialism um, and kind of pseudoscience. We see there's um, a book that was published um, uh, about 15 years ago uh, by uh, Ross McKittrick and Christopher Essex. Uh, Ross McKittrick is, a, is an economist, so basically a social scientist. Uh, Christopher Essex um, uh, apparently is a professor of applied mathematics. Um, and what they wanted to do is say, you know, the, the world is not warming. And so they present an example that purports to show that whether you use the arithmetic or some other mean, so averaging, can affect whether or not you find a global warming trend. And this was kind of debunked by, uh, their, their position was debunked by uh, a, a skeptic blogger, um, uh, Tim Lambert. Uh, so he, he basically said, look, this doesn't make sense. So first of all, they say that we're going to take temperatures from around the world and we're going to use different forms of average. Now, those of you who remember all the forms of average, the easiest average is to sum things up, divide it by the number of things. That's the mean. But you've also got the mode. You've also got the median. You've also got other weighted means. It gets really exciting. And there's a thing called the root mean square which no one ever uses to average temperatures. This is actually um, incorrect from the point of view of physics. However, that doesn't stop um, science deniers from using it. So first of all, we've got an example of using bad physics. So they then put it in a spreadsheet. Now, they're not really spreadsheet heroes, so you get this code all the way through the spreadsheet, copied, pasted, repeated. 
Yeah. It, it's sort of beautiful in a kind of matrix type way. Yeah. So being somebody of a developer disposition, I decided to write this as code. And because I like you, I did it in Visual Basic for Africa, VBA. Yeah, that was not a good day. Um, OK, so this is what they're doing. They're going through the cells, and they are, they, uh, they're, they're averaging, they're correctly adjusting for um, Celsius, Kelvin scale, all the rest of it. They're doing all the right things here, or so it looks. Um, so in other words, we are using bad physics, but at least this is, looks like a correct calculation. Um, and when using the RMS, they calculated the trend. They found an overall cooling trend. Oh my goodness, the world is cooling. So they thought, hmm. I looked at their graphs and something seemed wrong to me. Some stations had missing values. They used 10 stations around the world for their data. Just be very, very clear. The world, the surface area of the planet is around 500 million square kilometers. We're now going to use 10 locations to determine um, the, uh, 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 the uh, trend of the climate. So it's not statistically strong. And then some of these have missing values, in some cases eight. What I did is I contacted Tim Lambert, and he sent me the original spreadsheets, and the error was really obvious, even though I'm not a spreadsheet person. Um, when you use the average function in Excel, if there is an empty cell, it does the right thing. If I have 10 cells and two of them are empty, it will only average with respect to eight. It will only divide by eight. Unfortunately, for their calculation of the root mean square, this was not the case. What happens is it interprets an empty cell as zero, which is very, very cold. Well, it's not here. Actually, no, we're just above zero. But compared to most of the planet, that's cold. So it has a cooling effect. So they wrote this. What they should have written was, oh, look, an if statement. I don't need you to read VBA, so you can wash your eyes out with soap afterwards. What I do need you to understand is one of the simplest things of, so what we have here, wait a minute, let's, let's just recap. Bad physics, bad statistics, and now we have bad code. Now we're going to fix the code so we just have bad physics and bad statistics. But at least we have good code. Okay? Again, this was not peer reviewed. But it came about through a simple oversight that anybody would have been able to spot um, had they been uh, a developer or had they bothered to test it. As Stephen Levy observes, with spreadsheets, the danger is not so much that incorrect figures can be fed into them as, the, uh, as that garbage can be embedded in the models themselves. This has profound implications. The classic phrase, garbage in, garbage out. But let's take two systems that are correct and interact with one another. Very simple. Systems, again, that people can configure easily without realizing the consequences because they're so focused on something. This happened a few years ago, I think, uh, what was it, 2011? Um, I just want you to look at the prices over here for a moment. And I want you to look at the title. The Making of a Fly, The Genetics of Animal Design. I'm sure if you are into genetics, this is a very good book. But I don't see it being millions of dollars good. And you've got two, so basically this is not Amazon themselves, this is two vendors using Amazon, Profnath and Body Book. And what, what this blogger did, uh, um, Michael Eisen did, is he went through and he said, that's really interesting, they seem to be escalating, okay? The prices seem to be escalating, using the same ratio. That's really interesting. What you have is an example where you have an automated system and an automated system, this is how it works. What we're going to do is we've got a book. We don't want to sell it too cheaply, so we'll see what other people are selling it at and undercut it. That's your 0 .99830. We'll always be cheaper than anybody else. And we've got our eyes on Bordy, but we've got our eyes on the other guys, okay? We see you, we see you. We're going for 0 .9983 of whatever you bid. These other guys don't actually have the book. They're speculating. So what they're doing is saying, if you put in an order, we'll go and buy it from somewhere else and then charge you a little more for having it. So we don't actually have it. So we need to have, be able to cover our costs and make a profit. And that ratio is 1.27059. And yeah, we see you. <laughs> it reached over $20 million before 
before it was trapped, okay? And be wise, oh, no, it's okay, we've got safeguards for this. Have you? As you may have noticed, Britain has made some rather interesting decisions recently. I use interesting in very big quotes. And some of these have had a very profound impact on the exchange rate of the pound um, to other currencies. But even given that, even given the massive devaluing of the pound, this event last year was unusual. Okay? Um, in the space of really just a few minutes, the pound crashed hugely against the dollar. How did this happen? Algorithmic trading, exactly the same model that we just saw with Amazon, but at a larger scale with banks and at speed. Um, Earl Wiener, um, who is kind of like a guru of safety critical advice and systems uh, in aviation, made this observation. Digital devices tune out small errors while creating opportunities for large errors. What we, find with op what we find with automation, you see, the point is that each of the individual automated trading systems was working correctly according to specification. Likewise here, we're focusing on this. It's what happens if something is used in a different way. What happens if it interacts? The great thing about automation is it allows you to do the wrong thing at massive speed. Human beings can't make this kind of screw up. We've, we've created software to screw it up for us. That's way smarter. So here's a piece of advice that is often used in engineering circles and was popularized by Facebook most recently. Move fast and break things. And that's sort of good advice, except when it isn't. Because a lot of the time, what we find is that the breaking things has social consequences. It's not consequences that you're running a simple experiment uh, as to which is the better architecture, which is the better framework. Uh, how do I unit test this? It turns out that the breakage can have large scope, fairly large scope. This is the question we've been asking for the last year and a half. Um, pretty much there were concerns before it, but after after the um, referendum in the UK and the election of Trump, then suddenly it's a case of like, well, how is all of this happening? What's happening here? Facebook is harming our democracy. It turns out that we've accidentally created something um, that based on simple views of algorithms um, and simple views of how a system is supposed to work that interact very poorly with the real world. Um, as uh, uh, this recent quote um, from uh, a sort of gathering of uh, tech leaders talking about the weaponization of social media shows. We hardened our financial institutes, uh, institutions against hacking, but it never occurred to us that the minds of our voters could be hacked. You are part of the system. The software you create is also part of the system. It changes the world in which it lives, and therefore it ultimately changes its inputs. And it's not that anybody was necessarily doing anything evil, but we have to keep in mind, as was observed here, um, Facebook is now in the awkward position of having to explain why they think they drive purchase decisions but not voting decisions. Because that's what this stuff is about. In fact, to be honest, the original Facebook algorithm and a lot of these algorithms are intended to make somebody's breakfast look interesting or their pictures of cats. The whole idea is to show you what other people are interested in. Yeah? So that was the initial motivation. And guess what? You can put advertising on the back of that. That's brilliant. Imagine just being able to buy the things that you want that you know you're interested in. Yeah, but imagine that's the simple specification. That's the red-green stuff. Does this work? But what, how else will people use it? We also find there is an interesting consequence to this. Let's talk about testing. Let's talk about are people easily influenced? And this relates to a... Uh, a little experiment that um, Facebook did a couple of years ago. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not just picking on Facebook, because clearly I use Facebook. Um, I, uh, uh, I enjoy using Facebook, but I'm also very cynical of it um, uh, at times. And this is also applicable. This is not unique to Facebook. It's just that they offer us a very simple example. And we're going to see that um, it's, not e it's very easy for people to say, oh, that's just Facebook and Google being evil. I'm OK. We're going to see that actually it's a very slippery slope here. So, uh, we show via a massive N equals 689,003. N, let's just clarify what is being said here. That's the number of people. That is the sample size. So, about 700,000 people. That's about the population of Frankfurt. Okay? Um, a massive experiment on Facebook that emotional states can be transferred to others via emotional contagion. 
In other words, you can influence how people feel just by biasing their feed one way or another. I want to make you happy, so let's up, upvote the, um, intrinsically upvote the popular uh, positive ones. Let's downvote the negative ones. I want to make you sad. Let's upvote the negative ones and downvote. Um, leading people to experience the same emotions without their awareness. Whoa, dark, sinister stuff. By the way, if you're wondering, yeah, you, this does work. And people go, oh my god, this is so immoral. It wasn't in the uh, Facebook terms and conditions that people um, were going to do this. They changed the T and Cs about two months after this. And a lot of people go, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible. This is, oh, this is A-B testing. But A-B testing is considered a good practice. A-B testing, let's be very clear. What we're doing here is we're offering people two different versions of software, and we're seeing which one well, the original goal was which one is more usable, which one is better. The problem is that when you look up the word better in the dictionary, it's a bit fluffy. It doesn't really tell you what we mean by better. And if you are working for a company whose goal is to make money, it turns out that better means make more money. So what you're doing is, does software version A empty people's bank accounts faster and more effectively than software version B? That's what you're doing. You are influencing people's bank accounts. Um, you're influencing their livelihood. And it might not be with n equals 700,000, but it turns out that we need to be really, really careful. The world does not come in these conveniently defined boundaries. I have test unit tested my code, and I am a good person, all the way through to, I am darkness in Facebook and Russian bots. It's not easily defined like that. There is somewhere in the middle, there is a judgment call that we have to make. So we need to be very clear that sometimes we do things, and it turns out that the Facebook algorithm and other things are very good at what they do, but their original reason for what they do is not the way that they end up being used. And there's a, there's a word that kind of covers the situation we may accidentally have created or are in the middle of creating, because it turns out, believe it or not, we run the world. If you are in software development, you run the planet. So when you have that conversation over Christmas, you know, so, you know, one of your relatives or family friends says, so what is it that you do? You've now, got, you've now got a really good answer. I run the world. I run the planet. I, yeah. We depend so much on this, but there's also an additional caution that says, like, oh, hang on, I need to be a bit, perhaps a little more careful uh, looking at things. Now, one of the things I, I quite like is, as I said, taking pictures of books, um, but I also like words, and uh, I run this page on Facebook, um, Word Friday. Every Friday I put up an unusual, a definition of an unusual word uh, that I found, um, and the rest of the week is just other linguistics and word stuff. Um, but a while back, uh, last year, um, I came across a particular word, mechanocracy. It's not the same as technocracy. Uh, mechanocracy is slightly different. Um, government or control of society by machines or a state or other association of people who run in such a way. Now, this makes it all sound very Terminator, but the term refers more broadly to the wide-scale autom automation of governance and social management through software. We like this because it's convenient. We like this because it helps us. But there are very few things that do not have another side. So going back to 1980, Maya Lehman's observation, when we start looking at things like the testing, development processes, and our involvement, as mankind relies more and more on the software that controls the computers that in turn guide society, it becomes crucial that people control absolutely the programs and the processes by which they are produced throughout the useful life of the program. And this is important. This is why when you want to look at team composition and company makeup, what you're looking for is a wide range of people. Because one of the worst things you can end up with in a software development team, and also very easy to end up with, is a monoculture. We all think the same way. We're all from the same demographic. Um, and the problem there is you sometimes don't test or challenge outside of the initial frame. You may say, I'm a good developer because I've got my unit test working. It's like, that's just the beginning of the story. That is not the end. So I'd just like to end with kind of an observation, an adaptation of the quote, we create our buildings and then we create ourselves, a Churchill quote. We shape our algorithms, and afterwards, our algorithms shape us. I hope that's given you some food for thought. Thank you very much.